Hello and welcome to the discussion. Thank you. This channel is here to serve as a platform for scholarly discussions about some of the most significant questions regarding the history of early Christianity, the philosophy of religion, and systematic theology. Mine too. My name is Nahoa Life, and I'm here to ask those questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. So, who else feels really, really old right now? Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Today we're going to make our first foray to the channel of Nahoa Life, a remarkably polished young musician who in his early teens has started interacting with some of the biggest names in Christian apologetics, first on their platforms and now on his own YouTube channel. Aside from his age, what stands out are, first, his amazing production values, rivaling the best of any of the professional apologist channels, or even my own live efforts. Sharp camera, great sound, rounded corners, custom layouts. I think he's applying LUTs to guest video. On-screen graphics pre-prepared for interviews. Amazing. Second, while I think he ultimately lets his guests off a little easy when they give soft answers, he's giving them actual hard questions. Nahua is interacting with the strongest arguments against Christianity, and at least putting them into play. So let's see how this all shakes out when it comes to a familiar topic and guest. In conversations about the resurrection, one claim that's often made is that the apostles died for their faith. Today, we're going to talk about this claim and learn from perhaps the foremost expert on the subject. Dr. Sean McDowell, going back to his academic roots to discuss the case for Jesus from the sincerity of the apostle martyrs. Let's just get right into it, if that's all right. Let's, Let's start off by asking, by asking about the significance and your main conclusion. So, from your research, what does the evidence suggest about the fates of the apostles, and what do the fates of the apostles suggest about Christian origins? Well, partly what motivated me to research this is that I hear, had heard an argument that I know you've heard many times, that all the apostles, to their dying breath, proclaimed that Jesus had risen refused to waver even when they were being tortured. Therefore, their testimony is reliable. Christianity is true. When I was younger, I didn't give much of a second thought to this claim. I thought, well, that makes sense. People aren't going to die for something that you know they know is false. And it kind of felt like just a legitimate piece of the case for Christianity. Then as I got older, I started to think about this more deeply and frankly was challenged by an atheist friend of mine. Sadly, Sean got a little sidetracked and didn't come back to finish this thought. So let me just wrap that up from another time he told the story. I think there's also been a hyper trust by many Christians who read martyrs and says, hey, they all died as martyrs and they proclaim it. Well, I've made that claim in the past. So I repent on this show from making that before I did my research. That should be corrected as well. Now, as I'm very clear in my research, this doesn't prove that Christianity is true. I think at best, it's one piece, not an insignificant piece, that removes the idea that the apostles are liars, that they invented the story, that it was a big conspiracy. If you followed my channel before, you'll know that I don't think naturalistic explanations for Christianity require any apostles to be liars inventing the story. I think it's best explained by those who were out preaching to have been, for the most part, sincerely mistaken. I concluded that at least, uh, hands down, there's no reason to doubt the disciples existed. They all believed they had seen the risen Jesus and then were willing to suffer for that belief. And then at least some of them died, I think arguably up to six with varying degrees of probability uh, for that conviction. They died as martyrs. We'll come back to the first few points, but let's briefly look at the six. Yeah, so I would put Peter and Paul and James, the brother of John, son of Zebedee, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, in very high historical levels of probability. I actually rate Thomas and Andrew as more plausible than not, meaning that's probably like 51% more likely than not. 
The others I just concluded are as plausible as not. So it's just as likely they were martyred as they weren't. The evidence in a sense is inconclusive. Working backwards, you've got Thomas and Andrew at 5149. That's not going to cut it for me to sway a supernatural conclusion. In fact, in many interviews, Sean limits his list to four. Is there anybody else that you have pretty high confidence for that they did die? Those are the only four I think we can put in first century consistent early documents. So I'm not sure why he inflated the list for Nahoa. In any case, Sean advocates that Peter, Paul, James, son of Zebedee, and James, the brother of Jesus, were martyrs under his definition. But one thing to come out of this new interview is to learn that Sean is backing away from one of these. James, son of Zebedee, that was probably the only thing in your whole 400-something page dissertation I disagreed with. And there's a few things I've changed my mind. Number one, I probably would assess James, the son of Zebedee, one notch down. And that's mm. because we have one good source for James in the book of Acts. Now we have no tradition of anything else that happened to James. And we have other corroboration and later writings. So I think we're on very solid historical ground. But I probably put that a little higher than it should be given one source. That's one I would revisit. The only source we have for the martyrdom of James, son of Zebedee, is a single non-corroborated New Testament document. And around here, we call that, or the Bible tells me so. Let's remember the fact that Sean wants us to lower confidence for something when our only source is Acts. And when it comes to the most certain, Peter, Paul, and James, brother of Jesus, even the Christian apologists acknowledge that the circumstances make their deaths of virtually no evidential value. Peter and Paul, as you rightly said, seem to have got caught up in that persecution. And it seems that Nero's motivations for persecuting the Christians was not so much theological precision, uh, but it, rather it was political. He needed a scapegoat. So I, I, I do think that that uh, does reduce the evidential value of their of the specific fact that they're martyred. There's no reason at all, in fact, some reason to think otherwise, that the apostles uh, that were persecuted under Nero, Peter, or Paul, etc., were given no opportunity to recant. There, there's reason to think that they probably weren't right. given um, opportunity to recant, and no reason to think oh. that there is. And, of course, only Peter from that trio was actually one of the twelve. Even though Sean used the imprecise term disciples for Paul and James, who were not in the twelve. I appreciate that you make a more nuanced claim as opposed to the blanket assertion that all the apostles were killed for their faith and they wouldn't die for a lie, therefore mm. Christianity is true. There's a seedling of a good argument there, but it's not expressed with precision. So with the murder argument put to death, so to speak, let's see if Sean has anything new for the case for eyewitnesses to risen Jesus who were willing to suffer by preaching risen Jesus. So here's my question. If we have good evidence for only about half a dozen probable martyrdoms, then how can we say with confidence that all the apostles were willing to suffer and die for their continued profession of the resurrection faith? Isn't it the case that when it comes to most of the apostles, sources are either late, lacking, or legendary? We have, at least at the beginning, I think arguably very strong from the book of Acts, the apostles, putting themselves in harm's way, willing to suffer. As is always the case, Christians point to the first four chapters of Acts as our only source for any of the twelve doing anything at all in terms of proclaiming Jesus. And you just heard Sean admit that he made a mistake in overstating the case for James because Acts was his only source. So Acts doesn't get us to the end of the life of all the apostles. But it does get us, as I carefully stated in my dissertation, a willingness to suffer. And because their savior had been put to death, at least minimally, a willingness to die for this message from all of the apostles. Just like James, our single source that eyewitnesses were preaching anything at all about Jesus is... Now, what we can look at is the church fathers... And I won't walk through the list. This is, I walked through this on my dissertation, but from the end of the first century through the second century, there's at least eight or 10 that consistently say the apostles believe they'd seen the risen Jesus and they go proclaim this to the ends of the earth. In chapter three of his book, 
Sean lists eight sources that he feels affirms his premise. If he'd gone into more depth in the interview, I'd argue against each as reliable, independent, or relevant. But after he lists them, Sean himself admits that the historical value of these individual sources undoubtedly varies. So for today, I'll leave it at that. So minimally with the other apostles, I think all we can argue is that they have a willingness to suffer and die, put themselves in harm's way for their belief that Jesus had risen from the grave. I really don't think you can. Don't let apologists get away with granting themselves unspecified groups. Of the 12, Paul mentions only Peter and John as out preaching. We have nothing from James, the brother of Jesus, about what he saw, and Paul was a post-ascension vision from years later. That these fewer than a handful of people were sincerely mistaken is a relatively modest proposal, hardly needing a supernatural explanation. One thing about the book of Acts, and I might be misremembering this, but in Acts 4 and 5, for example, it's not all the apostles who are preaching and being persecuted. It's just Peter and John. So in the book of Acts, and again, I might be misremembering, but at the beginning, he mentions all the apostles and Peter's delivering sermons kind of in the name, like he's representing all the apostles. But then as the book progresses, they just focus on Peter and John and then Paul and Barnabas. So can you use the book of Acts as evidence for even the apostles who weren't the main ones? Great question. Yeah, I think you can because the gospel wasn't just being preached through Peter and John. So it focuses on Peter and John, but it's not meant to imply at all that they're the only ones preaching this message. In fact, I think the earlier part of Acts is very clear that they all did, even though it focused on Peter and John. And then around you know 12 and 13, it shifts to Paul. That doesn't mean the apostles stop preaching this message. It means that Paul is now the one that's advancing Acts 1-8, where he takes it ultimately to Rome. Yeah, that, that's a fair response. No, it's not a fair response. Acts doesn't say who preached. So that's evidence that eyewitnesses definitely preached? That's an argument from silence. That would be ad hoc. That's right, it would. Or maybe post hoc. Second, how evidentially forceful is the lack of evidence uh, for their recanting? If they had recanted, would we expect to find some evidence that they had wavered in their faith? And this is Technically, you might say an argument from silence. Indeed, they're popping up all over. Just as there's no evidence for an eyewitness recanting, there is absolutely no evidence that an eyewitness was given a chance to recant. Even worse, there's significant evidence that Sean's confirmed martyrs, Peter, Paul, and James, would definitely not have been given such a chance. Watch the full interview and ask yourself if Sean's argument from silence don't equally apply to no records of refusal to recant. So if you can establish that someone mm. is willing to suffer and die for what they say and do, I can think of five possible options. Um, the first one is sincerity, which is, you know, which is the motivation that you would ascribe to the apostles. And that's the reason why they were willing to suffer and die. Here's that slippery word again. Apostles. Name them. That's the motivation we would ascribe to Paul and his proclamations from years after Jesus left the earth. And granting all this, it's the motivation to ascribe to Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and maybe the two sons of Zebedee. A handful of individuals whose sincerity can be relatively easily explained in the category of sincerely mistaken. If they can be sincerely mistaken, then this whole martyr conversation is done. Part of making this case when it comes to sincerity is what were the apostles proclaiming? What was the heart of their message? And the heart of their message was that Jesus had risen from the grave and they had seen the risen Jesus. We have a firsthand account of what Paul saw and it was super vague. Last of all, he appeared to me. There are no details. This would fit a ghostly apparition in the sky just as easily as a man on the road. We have no first-hand account from Peter or from James, the brother of Jesus, or from John. Even if we grant the New Testament books written in their names, 
which I definitely do not. So, what did they had seen risen Jesus mean to them? An actual, physical, veridical Jesus is not the most obvious conclusion here. It's just the one that won. So it seems obvious to believers. It's not backed by data. So especially given what that message cost them immediately, I think right away it's fair to at least assume at the beginning, barring a better explanation for their suffering, that they actually are sincere. Yeah, that's good. So sincerity, so choosing option one kind of, or attributing sincerity as the motivation of the apostles might be the default until you get a defeater or until you get a better rival hypothesis. Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. And so generally I would approach that with anybody when they tell me something, I'm going to say, okay, I believe you give me reason to discount. But surely the nature of the proposition itself can be a reason to discount. If a trusted loved one tells me they were in a car accident, I'll assume that's true and spring into action. If that same trusted loved one tells me that a wizard opened a portal and that a dragon from another dimension stomped on the car, my default is going to be loving skepticism. So I think that's just a general principle. Maybe some people would be more skeptical and not believe anybody until they prove it. But I think that's a default way that I would approach it. And then when we start to narrow down with the apostles, what they're suffering for, what they claim, what it costs them, it just buttresses that claim of sincerity. So yes, borrowing a better explanation, the one they give us, the one Paul gives us, the one the early church fathers consistently give us. Again, the handful of potentially preaching eyewitnesses don't give us an explanation. Paul gives us a late vague one, and we don't have church father reports that are independent and reliable if they were even in a position to know beyond hearsay. Sean and Nahoa went on to discuss a number of possible reasons the apostles might have been lying about resurrection, but like them, I don't find those as interesting or compelling until we get to... But this fifth option is perhaps the apostles were driven by other selfish uh, incentives such as sex, money, or power. I see Nahoa is also a J. Warner Wallace fan. This is his famous trilemma for crime motivation. Because these are the only three motives behind any lie or behind any murder, and I learned these by investigating murders. It comes down to financial greed, sexual lust, and the pursuit of power. Or maybe in this case, authority that were seen to be worth the risk of death. So maybe an analogy might be Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was in a position to know whether his story about the golden plates from God was true or not. Joseph Smith was killed for those beliefs and never recanted. Yet I'm guessing Tim and Eric do not accept this as proof that Mormonism is true. This is a great question, and I think it's uh, fair to compare the apostles with Joseph Smith. Now, I might say, I think the book of Abraham shows pretty clearly that Joseph Smith was a false prophet. I'm not sure it proves he was necessarily insincere about what he believed. Minimally, it showed that he's a false prophet and got it wrong. Maybe he really thought he had the powers to translate this document and deliver it in a certain fashion. I mean, I'm just not certain that alone proves the lack of sincerity. When it comes to the question of another motivation, I think you mentioned sex, power, and money. This is where my friend Jay Warner Wallace is super helpful. Now, he's not a biblical scholar, he's not a PhD. He's a cold case detective. So he's never lost a case in, I don't know, 30 some years. And I'm appealing to him as an authority here because he is one of the most foremost experts on the law and motivations that criminals have. That is impressive. But of course, it would be up to the district attorney to select which cases actually go to trial. And since that's often an elected position, they tend to be pretty picky. I'd be curious to know what percent of cases Detective Wallace put forth were then chosen for prosecution, or what percent of cases he was given he was able to close. None of that matters. Just curious, since it's his authority Sean is invoking. And he says in every case he's ever done, it's either sex, power, or money. So let's take the, the issue of sex. Well, if you start with Jesus he would still pass the Me Too movement. He was single, and by all accounts, 
only show dignity and respect and care for women, period. Jesus of the Bible, yes. Paul of the Bible, maybe not so much. So if they're following after Jesus, this clearly isn't a movement to get the ladies. That's obvious in that culture at that time. Maybe or maybe not. I mean, Jay Warner Wallace, who we're talking about here, came to Jesus because of a woman. Uh, and if it not for my wife, I would probably never have looked at it at all. Take, uh, what was the second one? Power, sex, let's take money. It's not that Jesus was necessarily poor. He might have been somewhat middle class or lower middle class as a carpenter. But this is not a movement about getting money. It doesn't have to be life-changing Elon Musk level money for someone to be motivated by money. The disciples in question were fisherman class laborers when they met Jesus. Now they were able to be traveling preachers rather than return to the nets. Even that modest kind of money can be motivation. Something Sean admits about himself later in the video. My job is obviously tied to my worldview. I teach at Biola University. So if I gave up belief in uh, pro-life, if I gave up belief in inerrancy, uh, I would not teach at Biola anymore. But I have to be honest that that does affect, uh, that's at least a piece that could prevent me from following truth if I'm not careful and I'm not wise about it. Money is absolutely a possible motivation for the apostles. I would say just authority, I, I don't think it's more plausible than sincerity that they were you know, lying to gain authority, but it's something that I've thought about. If I were to invent a motivation and go with the one apart from sincerity, it would probably be this one. Because people can create even their small kingdoms for a sake of personal authority and power. That can happen. As I mentioned to Sean in our debate. But in terms of power, when I was in church ministry, when I was in youth ministry, I saw over and over, it only takes the smallest piece of power for people to lust after that power. So you put someone in charge of the bake table, bake sale table, that person is all in on the power of that, that bake sale <laughs> table. Uh, you put someone in charge of, you know, making sure where people are going to sleep. Well, they take that kingdom very strongly. It feels to me like these apostles, these disciples, you know, got a taste of what it was like to be popular. But I just have a hard time believing that's true for all of them in light of still mm. what it cost them in the culture and that nobody would correct the other person's use of power. As we've established, unless Sean can convince us otherwise... This is a very small number. It need have been a factor for only James, the brother of Jesus. It's not a perfect analogy, but Robert Kennedy's natural career path was laid out before him when his brother, President John F. Kennedy, was killed. And like James, Bobby was also later killed for political reasons. They're human. I'm sure at some point they enjoyed being a part of the 12 and having some authority like i think it'd be crazy to say that that wasn't an element of it a possible contributing factor to any social contagion for james and john to pick up on peter's bereavement vision but that that's the motivating factor to preach a message that gets them beaten thrown in prison killed an enemy of the state that little modicum of power of a new struggling movement just doesn't strike me as sufficient to explain what we know about them. Given what little evidence we have about what Peter, James, and John were preaching or experiencing, Sean is imagining scenarios and dismissing explanations based on personal credulity over actual evidence. This is why we have to go back and say, what is the person's sincere about exactly what were peter james and john sincere about exactly did they tell us in their own words no given that they ended up meeting paul in jerusalem i think it's fair to say they were all affirming jesus rose from the dead but any details beyond that are not known and anyone beyond this tiny crew is also not affirmed not group appearances not 12 eyewitnesses going out and putting their life in danger. None of that. So evidentially speaking, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims, and myself, if we're willing to suffer and die for it, 
are probably on the same level. But the apostles aren't sharing something that had been passed down to them for centuries from others, third, fourth, fifth, sixth hand. They're saying, we have seen the risen Jesus. And they're still willing to testify as witnesses for this. Again, this is true for Paul. Peter, John, and James, the brother of Jesus, were out there saying something. But we don't have accounts of them saying they personally saw a risen Jesus to provide this first-hand evidence in the way that Sean is overextending here. He's filling in blanks with wishful thinking. They are in a different epistemic position than people centuries removed from the claims themselves. And they're the ones that pass on this tradition. They're the ones that first write some of the gospels and of course, Paul, the letters of Paul, uh, his letters. Peter did not write a gospel. James did not write a gospel. Some think that John wrote a gospel, but I do not, for reasons too detailed for this particular video. According to Acts, these individuals were illiterate. They didn't write any part of the New Testament. Another discussion for another day. When you ask what affects my worldview, I think there's emotional, there's financial, there's relational, there's a ton of factors. And I think the only way to mitigate this is to be honest with myself, to have a lot of conversations with people who see the world differently, which I do regularly on my show. I read a ton of books. And when it's all said and done, just try to make sure I have integrity in my life and my scholarship. That's all any of us can do. I trust that my thoughts here will continue to help you hone your own thoughts about apologetic arguments from martyrdom, persecution, and sincerity. Oh, gosh, Nahua, I am so proud of you. Getting to know you and be a part of your journey has been a huge blessing for me and your whole family over the past couple years. Keep seeking after truth. Keep asking questions. Uh, I think the future is super bright for you. None of us can know where Nahua's truth-seeking journey will take him, though I have my own hopes. But no matter where, I envy that his young Christianity is at least an informed one and that he is treating this all with a skeptical eye and asking more difficult questions than the average Christian YouTuber. Awesome. Uh, Thank you so much. I'll probably have to do the obligatory, if you're watching this, please subscribe, like this video, comment. It's good for engagement, I think. So they say, Nahoa. If you'd like to see more of my interactions with Dr. Sean McDowell, tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Later. Thank you.